sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him, because they will see something they had never been told before, and they will understand something they had never heard before. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root from dry ground. He had no attractiveness and no majesty. When we saw him, nothing about his appearance made us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man who knew grief, who was well acquainted with suffering. Like someone whom people cannot bear to look at, he was despised, and we thought nothing of him. Surely he was taking up our weaknesses, and he was carrying our sufferings. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all have gone astray like sheep. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has charged all our guilt to him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb he was led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent in front of its shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away without a fair trial and without justice, and of his generation, who even cared? So he was cut off from the land of the living. He was struck because of the rebellion of my people. They would have assigned him a grave with the wicked, but he was given a grave with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence and no deceit was in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, and to allow him to suffer. Because you made his life a guilt offering, he will see offspring. He will prolong his days, and the Lord's gracious plan will succeed in his hand. After his soul experiences anguish, he will see the light of life. He will provide satisfaction. Through their knowledge of him, my just servant will justify the many, for he himself carried their guilt. Therefore, I will give him an, an allotment among the great, and with the strong he will share plunder, because he poured out his life to death, and he let himself be counted with the rebellious sinners. He himself carried the sin of many, and he intercedes for the rebels. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
a lesson from 2 Corinthians. For the love of Christ compels us because we came to this conclusion. One died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died in their place and was raised again. As a result, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we knew Christ according to the flesh, we no longer know him that way. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, inasmuch as God is making an appeal through us. We urge you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who did not know sin to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Please stand. The Gospel according to John. Carrying his own cross, he went out to what is called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a notice written and fastened on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this notice because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. They also took his tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it. Instead, let's cast lots to see who gets it. This was so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So the soldiers did these things. Jesus' mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene were standing near the cross. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that time, this disciple took her into his own home. After this, knowing that everything had now been finished, and to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they put a sponge soaked in sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated.
Yet you are seated as the Holy One, praised by Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and they were rescued. They trusted in you and they were not disappointed. Amen. The word of God that we'll focus on this evening on Good Friday is from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 53. I'd like to read for you again just verses 3 through 7. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Christ the Crucified dear fellow redeemed. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of a herald who proclaims peace and preaches good news, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. We don't usually associate that particular verse from Isaiah with Good Friday or even really with the time of Lent at all. Normally, that text is part of what's read on Christmas Day, of all times of the church year. And yet those very words from the prophet Isaiah are just a few verses removed from where our text this evening begins in Isaiah 52. Those words talking about a herald talking about someone who comes with swift, beautiful feet with one sole purpose to proclaim good news to the people of God to share the gospel. It certainly is a fitting thing to think of those heralds as the angels that sang out about the birth of the Savior on Christmas. But if you were to read that text in context, with everything else surrounding it in the prophet Isaiah, and then come to what follows. I dare say you might wonder if it really is good news that the herald brings. You might wonder if this really is supposed to be some kind of gospel for us when your eyes of faith see what the prophet's eyes of faith saw by divine revelation. The picture that he saw was pretty horrifying. Many were appalled at him. His appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form was disfigured more than any other person. That's the picture of our Savior that the prophet Isaiah saw. It's pretty ugly, it's pretty horrifying. And it gets even worse. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. Yes, it's almost, it's, it's beyond calculating, it's beyond imagining, it's beyond thinking about this image, this gory, bloody, disastrous image of our Savior suspended from the cross 
And then somehow imagining that that could be good news. If we didn't know the rest of Scripture, none of us could ever possibly come to such a conclusion. And I don't think Isaiah could either. And still, it gets worse as he keeps describing it. Surely he took up our infirmities, carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. It's as though the prophet Isaiah were there to witness every grueling detail of Christ's suffering and death. It's as though he could just see the soldiers mocking him, beating him, scourging him. It's as though he was there to hear with his own ears, even though he was some 700 years removed, but to hear it from Pontius Pilate's own lips, the condemnation of our Savior. It's as though he could hear ringing in his ear the echoes of the crowds who chanted for the crucifixion of Jesus. It's as though the prophet Isaiah were right there to watch as the nails pierced his hands and his feet, that he were right there to see the blood dripping down his head because the thorns were pressing in on it, because he was beaten over the head repeatedly. It's as though the prophet were right there to see it all take place, standing next to John and the women, looking up at his Savior and seeing exactly in every detail what was going to happen. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. It's a pretty despicable picture that the prophet paints for us. And when we read the events that, that came to pass that day on that first Good Friday, it's almost unfathomable that the prophet was able to describe it so vividly and so accurately because it's exactly what took place. That's how divine revelation works. You see, remember, it's, it's not as though God somehow uh, revealed or, or that, that he somehow managed to take the prophecy and then with each detail Jesus said, oh, now I have to fulfill this and now I have to fulfill that. It's the other way around. Jesus was crucified. And that plan was set in stone with every detail and he already knew exactly what would happen. And so, as though it were happening before his very eyes, God revealed it to the prophet. And the prophet Isaiah describes it more accurately, with more detail than just about any other prophet in the entire Old Testament. And here, in chapter 53, we wrestle and we struggle with how this could possibly be good news. How we could praise the feet of Isaiah as a herald who would run to us and proclaim the most gracious news that could be proclaimed. You see, the truth is we're not supposed to, on Good Friday, dwell on the physical torment of Jesus. That wasn't really the point. That wasn't the main thing of what happened while Christ was on the cross, and yet it did happen. And so it isn't wrong for us to take note of those details, as gruesome as they are, as gory as they are. They twist our heart. They wrench our stomach into knots. They make us sick. And they happen. And they happened to our Savior, to our Christ, to our God. But that was really just scratching the surface of what really took place on that Good Friday. It was really just scratching the surface of the wound that Jesus really underwent. It was just the beginning. 
You see, because this is the truth on Good Friday, that when we see Christ and we see all of the torment that he underwent, what we're really looking at is not just Christ, but ourselves. We're looking at our sin upon the cross. It is the harshest law that we can possibly imagine or proclaim in Scripture. The harshest law to see what our sins did to Christ. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. From one point of view, from one perspective, I dare say the furthest thing from our minds should be that that would be good news. Because it was our sins that put him there. It was us and our iniquity, our guilt, our shame that held him suspended between heaven and earth for those hours. And we see the wrath of God the Father poured out as it should have been poured out on us. That's the law. And so where's the herald? Where's the good news in that? What could we possibly sing about or be joyful about or praise God for when we consider what our sins have done? And yet, understanding full well the full brunt of the law, understanding perfectly how we caused this because of our sin, that's the nature of the cross, that it isn't just law. It is where law and gospel meet. It is where they meet together so that we can witness, yes, our sin, our shame, our guilt. We were the ones that needed healing. But what we see on the cross is forgiveness accomplished. What we see on the cross is our guilt laid aside and taken away so that we would never have to feel guilty again. What we see on the cross is our iniquity, our sin, our trespasses, all of those words that describe just how filthy we were, and we see them erased, taken away, covered over, washed clean. How many different pictures can Scripture come up with, and each one more beautiful than the last? You see, that's the good news of Good Friday. It's the good news that the prophet Isaiah loves nothing more than to share with us again and again that he would be privileged to be the herald to deliver this prophecy to us, the gospel of the Old Testament, and that we would behold what our God has done. The gospel really is in the pronouns of this section. You hear that back and forth language, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Him for us, him for us, him for us. Because, dear Christians, the gospel is for us. Christ for us. And that's the good news. That's the gospel. It's the fact that God in the flesh gave his very flesh for us so that this flesh could be saved, could be raised on the last day, could break death even as Jesus himself would break death. 
And in order to do that, he first had to succumb to death so that he could break its power once and for all by forgiving sin. What more beautiful picture could we possibly think of on Good Friday? I dare say it is Good Friday. And not just good, like we kind of use the word and throw it around colloquially. Well, yeah, I guess it's pretty good. No. Good biblically. Good as God himself defined it. When Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And this is what our God has accomplished. He has accomplished salvation for his people. He has redeemed us. He has bought us back. He has made us his very own. Because even though our sins held him to the cross, they were what suspended him there, it was his love for us that refused to come down. It was his love for us that had determined to save the world save you and to save me and that's exactly what happened on the cross it's exactly what he accomplished when he declared paid in full it is finished salvation is accomplished and so it is how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of a herald who proclaims peace and preaches good news, who proclaims salvation. So Isaiah prophesied. So our Savior was crucified. So our Father was satisfied. So our God was glorified. And so we are forgiven. Now that is good news. Amen. For generations, people will be told about the Lord. They will come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet to be born, because he has done it. Amen.
we pray. Heavenly Father, you are a just God who accepts nothing less than perfection. All too often we fail to realize how much our sins offend you. We forget that the wages of sin truly is death. We forget that there actually is a hell. Lead us to recognize the seriousness of our sinfulness. Lead us also to admit our inability to make things right with you. Teach us to look to you as the only one who can make us just and right. Today we are reminded not only of your justice, but also of your love. You did not spare your own son, but gave him as a ransom for each one of us. Comfort us with the knowledge of this great love. Give us the peace that the forgiveness of sins brings. When we feel our guilt, point us to the cross, where our guilt was washed away in Jesus' blood. Lord Jesus, we thank you for paying the debt that we could not pay. We thank you for coming to earth so that we could be with you forever in heaven. For being our perfect substitute, we thank you, Lord Jesus. Son of God, you offered up your body as an unblemished sacrifice for sin and commended your spirit into the hands of your Father. Teach us to cast the cares of this brief life on our Heavenly Father and commit our bodies and souls to his love. Give us the courage to face death knowing that it is the gate to our home in heaven. The cross was once an instrument of death. It is now a sign of life. Dear Savior, we humbly kneel at the cross in awe of your power and of your love. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We glory in your cross, O Lord and we praise your holy resurrection. For by your cross, joy has come into the world. May God be gracious to us and bless us and, and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. For by your cross, joy has come into the world. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May God bless us still, so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and we praise your holy resurrection. For by your cross, joy has come into the world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. Christ Jesus lay in death's strong bands for our offenses given. But now at God's right hand he stands and brings us life from heaven. Therefore let us joyful be and sing to God right thankfully loud songs of Alleluia. Hallelujah. 